Welcome to the second episode. This is a continuation of my conversation with Bert Monroy. In the first episode, we talk about how Bert uses his BenQ display, how he set them up to get into his creative flow. If you haven't seen that yet, I'll leave a link to that video in the description. I highly recommend that you check that out. In this particular episode, we're going to talk about some of the tools or the new computers that are now more powerful that Bert is using to create even larger canvases for his painting with even more detail. One of the painting that Bert will show us is the size of 30 by 40 inch, which is extremely large for any type of illustration he's doing. And Bert is putting in a lot of details in his work. We're going to talk about the inspiration of his genre of work as well, why he is creating this, and to give us some insight into the work that he's doing. So let's enjoy this second episode together. This is Art is Right. Before we start, subscribe if you're new and hit on the bell icon so you'll be notified every time I upload cool new videos like this. Now using a Mac Studio that's a super powerful computer. Right there. And it's just sitting behind there. And one of the things too, tell us a little bit more about the size of this file because I think this is really crucial because this is one of your first like really large canvas, right? Yeah, it's, it's uh, the panoramas, the three panoramas like Times Square, which is five feet by 25 feet. Mm -hmm. They don't count, They're, that's totally different. For my general work, um, I would always work at 15 by 20 because that's the way I work traditionally on a 15 by 20 Bainbridge board. Um, if I needed more detail, I would go to 30 by 40. These were standard uh, uh, sizes for these boards. Uh, they're also standard framing sizes. Those are divisible by, you know, uh, 10 by whatever uh, yes. framing sizes. Uh, and I always wanted to do one that was 30 by 40. And uh, when I got the little uh, cylinder, which is down there, uh, in, still in the box, when I had this little cylinder, I tried to get to do a 30 by 40. I wanted to break away the, from the 15 by 20. Uh, I couldn't do it. It just, I, it would, chug, you know, it would just chug along really slowly when it was saving and, and working. The brush stroke didn't always uh, match. I would go like this, and then I have to wait for the line to form and so on. So um, I didn't do a 30 by 40, but I did a 22.5 by 30. I got to do that. I've done. Um, I did one painting, but it was so labor intensive that I only did one painting of that size. So when the Mac 2, uh, or the Mac Studio rather, uh, came out, I said, this is a lot of power. Let me try to do a 30 by 40. So that was the one, this one here was the 30 by 40, and I was able to do it. It was a little labor intensive, but things moved smoothly and saving didn't take long and so on. Uh, there's certain things that sometimes when you get too much detail, like in this guy here, um, down here at the end of the street, this street down here, there's a little truck that's about to turn the corner. And now you can start to see the pixels. Um, on the largest printer, I printed this on the 64 inch printer, you couldn't see the truck. It was so tiny that you really couldn't make it out, but I was able to create it. You know, so that was cool. So, um, so this is the only 30 by 40 that I've done. I'm waiting for something that has that much detail in the future to, to do another 30 by 40. But this is the only 30 by 40 that I did. I know, right? It's always interesting that you're able to get that much more detail. And the other thing too that I like about your painting as well is that, how would you describe your painting? Because I know it's very different from photograph and you explained that to me before where you're not just seeing, for instance, uh, with the depth of field where everything gets blurry in the background, you can zoom in all the way and you can see sharp yeah. all throughout, like wherever you pick in the scene, you can see sharp detail with a lot of information. Yeah, well, my purpose is uh, not to create, uh, like the, photorealism is a genre. Right. Okay, and the, the, the artists, Ralph Goings, Richard Estes, these guys, they pretty much adhere to the photograph. They, they follow the photograph. I don't. I, um, there's a lot of things in the photograph that I don't like. For instance, distortion. If I'm shooting up at something, everything's going to kind of go towards the, the center and the top and so on. That's not the way the eye sees it. That's the way the camera captured it. So when I am studying a particular piece, I will um, take photographs for the detail, but I'll also sketch it. Because by sketching, I'm seeing what the eye sees. So I can see the angles and so on. Um, so. Also, like Times Square is a good example. Um, the camera, when you shoot at night, okay, like 
the scenes of Times Square. Buildings way in the background they have all these little orange boxes. Okay, there's this orange glow to the thing. So the camera doesn't always capture the light right. I did a painting called uh, uh, Light in Warsaw. Now, it's a light, but the type of light that it was was casting a very greenish glow on, on the scene, which isn't, you know, what the uh, eye sees is what the camera captured, the way it reacted to that light. So in my Times Square, if you're standing in Times Square and you look way down there, it's not gonna look like a little orange box. You're going to see stuff in that window. Right. If you got binoculars, you might do it. Go and, and look at that. So that's what I'm trying to capture in my paintings, is to put you there. Not to give you a picture of it, to, but to put you there so that wherever your eye goes, it's gonna be in focus. Um, I was a uh, matte painter for a while at the Industrial Light Magic, and um, they told me I had to tone down. I said, you got, you know, this stuff. And I remember the first time I went to the, to the Gosi um, that um, I'm, I'm looking at my thing, it's like, oh God, it's, you can't look at that on a, on a big screen. It just was so sharp and it just didn't look right. So they told me you got to really dumb down. So when I started doing the, the, the work for them, it would just not be as detailed as I was used to. So in my paintings is the print. It's a whole different thing. When somebody's standing there, it's as if they are actually there. So wherever they look, like especially in Times Square, wherever they look, it's gonna come into focus because if they were there, that's the way it would be. So that's, and the colors are more what the eye sees rather than what the camera captures. Right. So I'm, I'm trying to recreate the scene, not, not just capture the scene. And I was gonna say one anecdote too, as we're kind of just wrapping up and learning a little bit more about your workflow and seeing your workflow is that every single Photoshop class that I teach in a college university setting, the first day when I have students in, there's just, you know, these photographer students starting to learn about Photoshop. The first thing I do is quickly talk about the program and I pull up a website with your video introducing the Times Square piece. Yeah. Every single class that is done because that, gets to the point of what Photoshop can do really well yeah. in a very creative manner that I do not have the capability to, that, to be that creative. So I'm using him as an inspiration, not just only for me, but also for my students as well in this well, class. Well, what's cool about that is that um, I, I did um, 14 hours worth of, of videos um, right. and they're all like six minutes and so for lynda.com, now LinkedIn Learning, on Times Square. And, um, all of a sudden, I started getting all these calls from teachers. Where, where's Times Square? I, I need to show it to my student. So I called um, LinkedIn. I said, what happened to Times Square? Oh, we took it down. We feel it's dated. I said, but a lot of that stuff is still pertinent. Yeah, but it's, it, it was done a long time ago. So I convinced them to give it to me. Give me all those files back. And because uh, I shot them there. So they gave me all the films and I put them up on my YouTube channel for free. So those, so I told all the teachers, they're, they're there, you have to go to, to the YouTube channel to find them now. But all that stuff is still available. Because I thought it was, you know, there's important stuff, how to do a stubble on a beard, you know, that kind of thing. Right. Uh, simple technique, it's just add noise and what you do with it. But they took all those things down. But a lot of teachers use Times Square as an example. By the way, you know, it hangs at the Computer History Museum in, Palo, in Mountain View. I have to check it out. Yeah, it's a big light box because uh, Epson originally had this gigantic light box, 25 by 30, uh, 5 by 25 feet, uh, that traveled all around the country with this thing backlit. It's really cool to see it. And um, with the new technology, it had, I think, 72 fluorescent bulbs. Wow. Uh, whereas now with LEDs, the, uh, and it was big, it was thick like this, and it sat in these big stands. Whereas the one that's hanging at the Computer History Museum, it's a little over an inch because it's LEDs and it's even brighter. So it's, it's something that needs to be lit that way, not lit from above, but lit from behind because it's lights. Right. Times Square is just lights at night. So it really has a real strong cast. But teachers use it a lot. First of all, because there's so many different techniques. Creating hair, like the stubble, like I said, cloth and uh, different jeans. materials, yeah, jeans, yeah. So there's so many different videos in there that I felt, you know, that stuff still works. Yeah. So I, I put it up there. And I distinctly free. remember, like, hands in the jeans pocket, the the way how you curve the jeans pocket, how, how you create the stitching on there, the patterns, the, yeah. the buttons that goes on those, like, rivets that goes on the jeans. Yeah. Mind blown. 
But here's the thing though, like even though that those videos may be older, they're not dated. There's still yeah. relevant information in it because it's just the foundation of what Photoshop has really been built on. A lot of what we're seeing right now in Photoshop, yes, there are tools that makes life easier in some aspect, mm -hmm. but the foundation that you were teaching way back when are still the same tools that are available in Photoshop. Today. And in some cases, if you know how to manipulate certain filters together and, and in conjunction with a layer style, you're gonna get a better result than things like AI. So uh, there's still a lot of things that Photoshop, those tools, is mastering those tools that are so important. It's not a push button. Because a lot of times in, in seminars and stuff, people say, can I just do that with a button push? Now you can, but you're not going to get the results that you really want unless you actually go in there and do a little extra work and, and, and know how the tools work. And it's just a kind of, like I, I tell people, like, especially with layer styles and filters, they have names. And I tell them, forget the names. The names are misleading because they give you all these controls. And by changing the mode or changing the color, you're going to change what that meaning uh, what that name is. A perfect example is uh, motion blur. I've used motion blur easily 100,000 times in my life, right? I've only used it twice for motion blur. It's what it's doing that, it, that creates an effect. So it, it's taking the pixels and stretching them, right? Which is great for doing reflections in water or creating textures like wood, which is one of the things in, in Times Square was a wooden frame I just did noise and then did a motion blur and then did a little uh, twisting of things to make it give it a grain and so on. So it's it's just understanding what the tools can do, and you sit there and you play with them and, and you learn all the different nuances that you can do, and and that's the most important thing about uh, mastering this program. Not just the push buttons, but beyond the push button, you right. know, combining things to get an effect. Yeah. Let me simply put it this way. For me, using Photoshop, I probably use about maybe 2 or 3% of the software. He is the master that will use probably about 90, if not like 100% of like Photoshop. Yeah, like pretty all the close tools. to 100%. Yeah. yeah, I would probably go as high as like, I'm going to say you are at the 100%, but... I will say that a lot of the photography stuff I don't don't get into. I did when I was doing commercial work, but in my paintings, I don't. I, I It's all painted. So a lot of the tools I don't use anymore. Right. They're there, I know how they work, but I don't usually use those. But I do use the major part of, of the program. Got it. Really cool. So I'm gonna leave links to Bert YouTube in the description. Definitely check out if his YouTube channel if you wanna learn more about Photoshop. Bert, thank you so much for your time and allowing me to visit your studio, get into your mindset, your workflow a little bit. This is really helpful and I think it's enlightening to many of my followers and also BenQ, you know, users as well, how you use these professional product in your creative workflow. I mean, that's important. Great. I hope you guys got something out of all this and uh, get out there and play. Yeah. See what you can learn. I might have said this in my conversation with Bert already, but the amount of detail that he is putting into his painting are just astonishing and just absolutely next level. Many times, like he mentioned before, the print won't even show those kind of details, but on a computer screen, you can really just zoom in and get all those astonishing details that are in his painting. I think that is really amazing. So I hope that you find that as inspirational as I have found it, being in awe by his work for over 20 years now. I'll leave a link to Bert's website and also his YouTube channel that contains many of his tutorials in the description, I highly recommend that you check them out. And also make sure you stay tuned to the channel, subscribe and hit the bell because in the next conversation I'll have with Bert, we'll be talking about AI and how it's going to change the creative world that we are in. So make sure you give this video a like and like I said, subscribe and hit the bell if you're new. And remember, it's not be trust.